uh, hello, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm very excited to have you here. Uh, before I start the, um, you know, the introduction of our speakers and the topic, I would like to read the disclaimer. Uh, this webinar is intended as a scientific educational session to inform laboratorians and healthcare professionals of the latest research and published data. The views and uses demonstrated in this presentation may not always reflect Currently, regulatory approved intended uses or claims of the product or assays. Support for, for this program is provided by Abbott. So, I would like to welcome you to this roundtable meeting around the um, about the role of risk certification for cardiovascular disease and uh, disease in COVID-19 era. I'm totally sure that uh, we'll have a great discussion today. And uh, before I start introducing our speakers, I would like to. Uh, give you um, uh, some um, learning objectives of this webinar. So um, I'd like to discuss what is the recent evidence of using um, the cardiac biomarker like high sensitivity troponin I in the general populations. I would like to describe in practical terms what is the algorithm and how we can incorporate the troponin I into risk prediction and clinical management practices. I'd like to elaborate more on the health economic evidence of using troponin I for cardiovascular risk assessment. And also I'd like to discuss what are the implementation learnings and what are the best practices shared by MedCAN. So my name is uh, Chrisus Varunis. I am a cardiologist and medical director, uh, medical affairs at Abbott Co Diagnostics, and uh, I'm, I'm very delighted to introduce also uh, our speakers. Let's start with our first speaker, uh, Dr. Carlos Ilbaren. Um, uh, is a um, is a research um, uh, scientist at Kaiser Permanente. Also, he's an adjunct assistant professor at the Department of Epidemiology. His current research area includes risk certification and private prevention. So welcome, Dr. Ilbaren. Um, I will move on to our next speaker. Um, Dr. Paul Hulicker um, is a senior director in medical affairs in HOR at Abbott. Dr. Yuliga has been involved in the area of HOR, uh, market tax and health policy. He currently works in the field of lab diagnostics with particular emphasis on evaluating the impact of diagnosis strategies on clinical pathways, healthcare uh, processes, and also outcomes. Welcome, Dr. Uh, Yuliga. And at last but not least, I would like to introduce Dr. Peter Nord. Dr. Nord is the chief medical officer at MedCant based in Toronto. He has accountability for clinical operations, quality and safety, professional practices, medical staff oversight. Dr. Nord is also an associate assistant professor at the University of Toronto. Uh, he was previously the chief medical officer of Unity Health Toronto, having spent many years leading hospital organization in Canada and US. So, um, so, uh, so let's start with our uh, webinar. Um, uh, I would like, first of all, to um, uh, ask Dr. Ibarren. So, we know very well that um, uh, we have an increase of cardiovascular disease burden uh, due to the uh, COVID-19. Um, uh, Sometimes it, it seems that um, the reason is that um, people are unwilling to have their health check-ins and also at the same time, it seems that um, also the COVID-19 has a huge uh, impact on cardiovascular disease burden. And I would like to ask you, what is the current situation? And, uh, and also my second question is how we can uh, utilize the cardiac biomarkers to stratify the risk in the general population. So uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks for being here, uh, Dr. Biden. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Veroni, for that kind introduction. Very excited to be here. And it is an honor to take part in this, uh, in this round table. And thanks, Abbott for extending this invitation. I would like to launch into my presentation because uh, in my presentation, I'll cover both issues, the impact of the COVID uh, pandemic on cardiovascular disease, and then how we can begin to incorporate uh, high sense to one into, into, into risk certification. And here, here are the two topics I'm gonna to be covering over the next uh, 20 minutes or so. First, I'll talk about cardiovascular risk certification and prevention in the COVID-19 era. And then I will move on to discuss how we can begin to incorporate high sensitivity troponin I into clinical practice. 
cardiovascular diseases, uh, which comprise mainly ischemic heart disease and stroke, uh, we know that they are the leading causes of mortality and a major contributor to disability worldwide. So we know that COVID uh, changed everything. So what happened to cardiovascular disease during COVID uh, and the COVID pandemic? I'm showing you here some data from our Kaiser Permanente group in Northern California. Uh, the first death uh, due to COVID-19 in Northern California was reported on March 4th, 2020. And I believe that was the first death reported in, in the nation. Shortly th thereafter, uh, I'm gonna use my pointer here, Shortly after, there was a steep decline in hospitalizations for acute myocardial infarction in mid-2020 during the spring surge or the first wave of COVID. This phenomenon recurred, even though to a lesser degree, in the winter surge of 2020-2021. And the reasons uh, we believe this happened were the uh, obviously the stay-at-home mandate uh, in, in very strictly uh, observed in California. And from the patient's perspective, the, the fear, really the real fear of going to the hospital. Interestingly enough, we saw the same trends for hospitalizations for stroke shown here in this slide. But for stroke, what we saw was the decline in hospitalizations in the spring surge, but we, not, we did not see that phenomenon reoccurring in the winter, in the winter surge. COVID-19 is a global pandemic and the illness uh, affects uh, multiple organs. Let me now show you some, um, this is data from a recent paper uh, that documents uh, the mortality trends nationally. This is data from the CDC between 2018, 2011 and 2020. Deaths to uh, coronary heart disease uh, are shown on the left, deaths to stroke uh, shown to the right. This lines represent a year-to-year -year change. And I want you to pay particular attention to the blue line, which is the age-adjusted line. So it's, although there was a little blip here between 2014 and 2015, the most remarkable finding was this uh, steep increase in mortality between 2019 and 2020. There was, uh, between these two years, overall mortality include uh, increase, uh, I'm sorry, by about 16%, mostly due to deaths uh, by COVID-19. But it's very important to uh, to realize that mortality from ischemic heart disease increased by 4.3% and for stroke increased by 6.4%. So we, here we have evidence that due to COVID-19, there's an increase in the mortality trends for both uh, heart disease and stroke. So COVID is a global pandemic. The illness affects multiple organ systems, including the cardiovascular system. This figure is from a, a recent uh, a, a review of the literature um, on long-term and acute complications uh, related to COVID-19 infection. Acute complications, uh, cardiovascular complications of COVID-19 include uh, acute coronary syndrome, myocardial injury, myocarditis, pericarditis, pulmonary hypertension, arrhythmia, heart failure, thrombotic disorders, cerebrovascular disease, and also structural changes in the heart, whereas long-term complications include heart failure readmissions, new onset diabetes, new, new onset hypertension, myocardial fibrosis, and risk of sudden cardiac death. So there's a profound effect of COVID-19 on the cardiovascular system. Let's move on now to uh, discuss the current standard, the practice, the standard practice for um, CVD versus certification. There are several formulas uh, that combine uh, traditional risk factors, such as the Framingham equation, score in Europe, or uh, the current one that uh, we, we use here in the United States, which is the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology whole cohort equation. Lipid profiles and high sensitive troponin have also been used and continue to be used, although CRP has uh, this, uh, the interest in CRP has really been diminished uh, because it's a uh, it's a hepatic marker of systemic inflammation. So these formulas allow us to classify the population into a low risk group, intermediate risk group, and high risk group. Low risk group typically uh, under 10% uh, risk in 10 years. This is for Framingham, 
10 to 20% intermediate risk over 20% risk over the next 20 years is considered high risk. And the recommendations are as follows. If a patient is at low risk, then there's uh, lifestyle counseling uh, for, for behaviors that impact cardiovascular disease, smoking, diet, exercise, and so forth. Patients at intermediate risk are also advise lifestyle counseling. And, and there's also a recommendation to consider a low intensity treatment if the risk factors are not controlled by lifestyle alone. Uh, the high risk group, uh, on the other hand, uh, are also advised by such counseling, but uh, in this case, pharmacological treatment should be uh, sort of more of a high intensity level um, approach. So there are problems and limitations uh, with this primary prevention tools. We know that these tools are suboptimal. Each of the scoring systems uh, have specific limitations that are shown in the slide, but let me just summarize uh, globally, what, what are the limitations? Uh, number one, these uh, tools are not applicable to everyone because they're usually limited by age or by geographic location. Secondly, there's great variability in risk assessment, whether you use one or the other. Third, they tend to be outdated and poorly calibrated to contemporary populations. And last but not least, uh, they tend to lack uh, cardiac specificity. Let me now move on to present uh, data pertaining to uh, imaging studies uh, that uh, have related levels of high sensitive point and eye uh, with imaging uh, biomarkers. And I think this is important because they speak to the cardiac uh, specificity of high sensitive point and eye. So the first study uh, was a study uh, conducted in, in Denmark uh, based on CD scans without contrast and in well over a thousand patients who were 50 to 60 years old without a prior history of cardiovascular disease. So this is the primary prevention setting. As you can glean uh, from the histogram to the left, the proportion of patients with presence of CAC or coronal calcium increased gradually as troponin levels increased. Coronal calcium, which I know is a we know is a marker of atherosclerosis, was detec detected in 30% of patients when troponin was, was in the lowest quartile and was uh, in, detected in 55% of patients when troponin was in the highest quartile. The presence of severe calcium with the darker lines here also went up as levels of, of high-sensitive troponin levels increased. And another important feature of the study is that the addition of high-sensitive troponin I moved the ROC curve for the prediction of, of coronary calcium. Which, which is clinically significant. The second study I'd like to uh, present uh, was carried out uh, by a group in Sweden. And in this case, they uh, looked at uh, unrecognized uh, acute myocardial function if MRI. Uh, the subjects were 250 volunteers, 60 years of age at baseline. And then they came back for a follow-up MRI when they were 75. And the investigators related the concentration of high sensitive troponin at baseline with a proportion of patients who develop the silent MI in five years. And the results demonstrated a progressive increase in the proportion of patients with silent MI as levels of troponin I increased over fifth from 12% to 13% to 30%. I will now uh, summarize uh, the, um, the evidence that exists in primary prevention, that is epidemiological studies or high sensitive troponin I in the symptomatic populations. In total, there's uh, five cohorts and two clinical trials in the, in the primary prevention setting, totaling 129,000 subjects. Uh, there's great variability in the outcomes that these uh, studies uh, are focused on, and follow up uh, varied from uh, five to 15 years. Uh, in the interest of time, I will not present. Uh, uh, advance or ERIC because basically replicated uh, the findings of Biomarker, which is by far the largest uh, cohort study published thus far. So this is the Biomarker, which was a consortium of 10 European cohorts, totaling almost 70,000 people with a follow-up of 14 years. The mean, mean baseline of the participants was 52 years. The key messages of the study can, as, uh, can be seen in the figure are uh, that individuals in the top fifth of the 29 distributions 
compared with the bottom fifth had first a 160% increase uh, risk of uh, cardiovascular causes, 92% risk of death by cardiovascular causes, and 62% increased risk of all cause mortality, as shown here on the, on the right panel. The second study I'd like to highlight is Zwasco, uh, the West of Scotland uh, clinical trial, uh, where pravastatin was investigated in more than 3,000 men, uh, 45 to 64, who had an LDL above 152. If the investigators in this study measured high sensitive troponin I at baseline, and then again one year into the trial to measure change in high sensitive troponin I, the, uh, the, the findings of the study got three main takeaways. First one is compared with the lowest quartile, participants in the highest quartile of baseline high sensitive troponin I were at 2.3 fall higher risk of myocardial infarction or death from coronary heart disease at both five and five 15 year follow-up. Secondly, and more uniquely so uh, because of the longitudinal design here, uh, there was a, um, a five-fold, the investigators demonstrated a five-fold greater reduction in coronary events when troponin concentrations decreased more than 25% compared when it increased 25% or more. In both the treatment uh, the placebo and the Pravastatin groups. And third, this study demonstrated that that uh, troponin concentration, um, that Pravastatin actually de uh, decreased uh, high sensitive troponin levels, and it doubled the number of uh, men whose troponin levels fell more than 25%. This is the data from the Hunt study in Norway, uh, where more than 9,000 people uh, were recruited, no cardiovascular disease at baseline, Follow up 14 years. And the final composite event of Hunt was uh, hospitalization for a myocardiovascular death. A unique aspect of this study was a head to head comparison of high sensitive troponin I with high sensitive CRP. As you can see here from uh, these two uh, graphs, uh, the, uh, there was a, a marked uh, difference in survival curves corresponding to troponin I groups at the top and CRP groups at the bottom. And as you can see, the separation of the groups is much more evident in the case of troponin and that in the case of CRP, indicating that high sensitive troponin I is a more selective and more useful marker for cardiovascular risk certification compared with high sensitive troponin I. The next study I'd like to uh, highlight is the uh, Generation Scotland uh, Family Heart Study, but which examined a very interesting question, which is, is the association of high sensitive troponin I with cardiovascular disease different in men and women? And the answer is yes. Uh, this study uh, recruited more than 9,000 people, 58% uh, were women, the average age was 48, 47, so it was a, a young cohort, and the endpoints included MI, stroke, and cardiovascular death. As can be appreciated in the figure to the left, the concentration of high sensitive troponin I tends to be higher in men uh, than in women. When they analyzed the data, the endpoint data, there was a, a greater displacement of the curve in women than in men, indicating that uh, high sensitive troponin I have more predictive utility in men, in women than in men. And in terms of association, uh, the analysis showed that troponin levels over 10 compared to levels below three conferred a 9.7 fold increase risk in women and a 5.6 increased risk in men. Again, suggesting that high sensitive troponin I uh, has a higher predictive value in women than in men. The uh, Jupiter 1 trial uh, was a, a multinational trial of rosuvastatin in more than 12,000 men and women who were free of cardiovascular disease and diabetes, but with an LDL under 130 and CRP greater or equal to two. The objective of this uh, sub-study within Jupiter was to determine whether markers of myocardial injury, high sensitive troponin I, or myocardial strain, brain network peptide, were associated with adverse outcome and whether the effectiveness of the intervention uh, statin therapy, in this case, was modified by either high sensitive troponin I or BNP. So the key findings of this analysis in Jupiter were as follows. High sensitive troponin I concentrations in the highest tertile were associated with the first major cardiovascular event with an adjusted hazard ratio of 2.19. Uh, 
Secondly, and perhaps more importantly, rosuvastatin was equally effective in preventing a first major cardiovascular event across categories for high sensitive troponin and I and BMP with no evidence of a statistically significant interaction. I will show you now data from the Pegasus TME54 trial, a multinational clinical trial comparing ticagrelor with placebo in patients with pyomyocardial infarction, thus representing a secondary prevention study. The objective of this substudy among 8,600 participants was to investigate whether the addition of high sensitive troponin I testing to guideline the right atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk can improve risk classification and downstream treatment recommendations. There are two key messages that uh, emerge from this analysis of the Pegasus TME 34 trial data. First, patients with lower risk of cardiovascular disease, but with high uh, levels of high sensitive troponin I, that is exceeding six, have the same rate of cardiovascular events of patients classified as having very high risk. The other side of the coin was patients with very high risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, but with undetectable levels of high sensitive troponin I, had a event rate similar to those patients classified as having low risk. Secondly, uh, the investigators concluded uh, that uh, incorporation of high sensitive troponin I into guideline derived atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk algorithms uh, provided enhanced risk certification and actually reclassified effectively 12% of the patients to a category, to a more appropriate category, to whom more risk-appropriate medical therapy could then be offered. So how do we begin to incorporate uh, the use of high sensitive troponin I in clinical practice? Uh, this slide, uh, uh, it's a, uh, this is the algorithm uh, that was uh, proposed by Veronis, uh, our chair, chair, chair member today, by Veronis and Bashiri uh, in a sponsored uh, feature article in Nature Communications last year. So let me walk you through the algorithm. Step one of the algorithm is the application of a traditional CVD risk prediction tool, for example, the, the framing hand uh, score or four cohort equations that will stratify the, the, the population in three, three risk groups low, moderate, and high. And as we discussed earlier uh, in, in the talk, the recommendations would be lifestyle consultation for the low uh, risk group, more aggressive lifestyle intervention, and low intensity pharmacological treatment if risk factors are not controlled by lifestyle changes in the moderate group. And um, then for the uh, high risk group, the more aggressive lifestyle intervention and high intensity pharmacological treatment. Step two then, is the measurement of high sensitive troponin I in everyone. And this will generate three groups. Those with, uh, on whom cardiac injury is unlikely, it, uh, high sensitive troponin is low, that is uh, less than six in men, less than four in women. Those with likely cardiac injury, if high sensitive troponin is between six and 12 in men or between four and 10 in women. And those with cardiac injury present, if, cardi if uh, high sensitive troponin is greater than 12 in men or greater than 10 in women. So then if in each of these groups, low, moderate or high, cardiac injury is unlikely, then there's no need to uh, for, for further workup. If cardiac injury is likely, this should prompt uh, additional workup, uh, such as a stress test, or nuclear perfusion test to ass for assessment of subclinical myocardial injury. If cardiac injury is present, they should also print additional uh, workup, uh, more urgently so, I would say, and a uh, discussion about uh, treatment in intensification. But uh, before incorporating high sensitive troponin into, into the risk discussion, uh, I'd like to touch upon the uh, issue of. Um, of false positives. Uh, in other words, secondary causes of high sensitive troponin elevation that are not directly uh, connected to, uh, to myocardial injury. Uh, so the clinician really needs to uh, uh, pay attention to, to, this, uh, to these causes. Uh, the majority uh, are acute conditions, uh, so, such as uh, strenuous exercise, running a marathon, something along those lines, uh, trauma, surgery, sepsis, 
But there are also chronic conditions where Heisen's troponin and I could be elevated, such as chronic kidney disease or anemia, as well as analytical causes that are, are, ought to be uh, looked at and uh, revised and corrected uh, accordingly. There are no published guidelines uh, on how to address this issue, but as a general principle, it is, avoid, it is it's advisable to avoid uh, high sensitive eye testing after intense exercise or, uh, or an acute illness episode, and, and then repeat the measurement to assess longitudinal changes. So in conclusion, uh, prevention of cardiovascular diseases remains a public health priority worldwide, and the COVID-19 pandemic uh, certainly has added impetus to CVD prevention and to addressing the issue of uh, health, health disparities. I've shown you that uh, current risk assessment tools are suboptimal. I've shared with you also evidence indicating that high sensitive troponin I meets the criteria set forth by the European Society of Cardiology required for a cardiovascular risk marker to be useful, namely cardiac specificity, predicted value, additive value, response to risk modification, and response to interventions. So I'd like to end with uh, a, a take home message uh, in my presentation, and that is that uh, I'd like to bring awareness uh, about uh, the paradigm shift of high sensitive troponin I from uh, being a diagnostic marker of myocardial injury in the acute hospital setting to a potentially useful CVD risk enhancer in the general symptomatic population. Uh, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Uh, th thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Baron. Uh, very interesting data. Um, and thanks for the great presentation. So I think that you presented the variety of evidence uh, regarding the high sensitivity troponin and how we can um, have a better uh, risk assessment by using this biomarker. Um, I would like to have the uh, the uh, questions at the end of the presentation. So, um, if I can move on to uh, our next speaker. Um, so, um, Dr. Juliger, I think that um, um, we need also not, not to uh, discuss the effectiveness, but also the cost. And uh, it's not so frequent to have the uh, cost effectiveness data in diagnostics, and especially for the biomarkers. So uh, could you tell us more about the, this kind of data? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, first of all, for the wonderful presentation and for inviting me here to this roundtable discussion. Um, I'm really excited to be here. And uh, you, you mentioned a very important aspect. I think whenever we talk about um, health services, new health services, um, we need to really ask the question, you know, does it help? Right? Is this is this effective? And also, is this cost effective? So in words, is this worth uh, the money? Um, because the resources are limited. And um, I, what I would like to present here is really to give some kind of early, early estimates of the so-called cost effectiveness of screening a general population for cardiovascular risk with um, high sense troponin I. Okay, my, my disclosure statement. Okay, I'd like to actually start with a brief reflection on the burden of CVD. And we already heard that CVD is the leading cause of premature death uh, across the world. And actually a third of all deaths is attributed to cardiovascular diseases. And given the socioeconomic threat, in 2013 already, the WHO member states um, agreed on a global action plan that aims to reduce the number of premature deaths by 25% by uh, 2025. So 20, 25, 25, it's quite a catchy name, but of course it's not just about premature deaths. So CVDs also impose a huge socioeconomic burden on health systems, uh, systems and communities just by diminishing uh, the quality of life and the disability to live a healthy life. Okay, so, and this this chart here 
illustrates um, the global burden in terms of the so-called disability adjusted life years or the dailies. And the daily is just a kind of an health economic term that's that is used as a summary measure um, and it combines the information regarding years lost to um, premature deaths and years lived with a disease. So in other words, the lower the daily, the better. And this maps this map here shows in dark blue the areas with lower burden and in orange red the areas with the highest burden of CVD. And of course, this is, you know, um, long before the pandemic. Globally, the median is around, just to give you some numbers, around 5,000 dailies per 100,000 people. So, but it's important to know, uh, sorry, it's important to note that there are really huge regional or as well as national differences, as you can see, in the burden, and that both reflect the differences in the underlying risk factors, but also um, differences in the access to healthcare. So the basically the daily basically indicates the gap between the current status and an ideal health situation, and this gap is caused in this case by cardiovascular diseases and its uh, sequelae. Okay, so obviously this, this, this gap really puts an enormous economic pressure on society. So globally, the costs are estimated of, uh, to about uh, $1,000 billion that are associated with uh, CVD. And only about 50% is really accounted to, for to uh, a direct medical cost. So that is the, 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 the spending that is um, accounted for diagnostics, treatment and, and hospitalization and so forth. And in addition to that, there's a huge loss in productivity. So that is caused by uh, premature deaths, the absence from work, reduced work performance, reduced employment and so forth. And these so-called indirect costs account for more than 25%, up to 50%, depending on the region um, of the total economic burden. So can I? Uh, okay. Um, okay. And in, actually, in light of this burden, and, and, and given the, the um, importance of modifiable risk factors, and issues and access to healthcare, the primary prevention initiatives um, and programs are really key to successful re re um, reduction of this burden. So the question is, you know, does this work, right? And we already had uh, heard about the um, um, a number of, of studies that, that um, go into the details of whether or not um, so we can demonstrate clinical effects. Um, but mostly CVD assessment is really done on uh, or is, is done with use of risk scores. So the European um, uh, score or the Framingham score and so forth. And what the evidence of primary prevention programs for CVD really, really uh, uh, mentioned, and that is what we already heard in the previous talk, that um, there, there is no clear evidence, um, or let's say there is no conclusive evidence, right? So, and it is also not possible to conclude that primary prevention in general is cost effective. So why is that? Why is that? Well, one reason might be um, the intrinsic limitation that we already um, learned about in the previous uh, presentation of population-based risk scores. But another reason for the lack of evidence is a the difficulty or the lack of randomized controlled studies. And these are indeed difficult to conduct. So the population of interest is pretty heterogeneous, right? The likelihood of an event is very low. Consequences may occur within decades rather than weeks, right? So, and very important aspect, of course, is the variation in management decisions or treatments effects that are frequently observed. So the question is, in this kind of situation of uncertainty and ambiguity, how are we filling the gap? What do we do in such kind of situation? Well, we built a model, right? We, if we wanna, if we wanna look into the future, you know, so we have weather forecast models, and here we are really interested in what is the effect of um, 
using high sense to opponent alpha risk stratification. How do we quantify the effect? Can we quantify the effect? And actually, as I already mentioned, you know, is this implementation worth the investment? So, and the health economic modeling study is the tool of choice to answer these questions until we have long follow-up studies um, conducted. Okay, so just to give you a few information or a recap on what is a health economic model, because most of you may not may not be that familiar with these 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 um, methodologies. In simple words, a health economic model is actually a simulation of the flow of actions. It is it, it simulates the the patient flow, the cascade of care over a predefined period of time, and it combines evidence from um, from um, several sources. So, because there is not actually the ultimate uh, uh, study that really informs, um, you know, the entire process here um, with data. So we need to pick, you know, so information from different sources. And a very important point is the extrapolation over time. So we a model helps us to extrapolate uh, information beyond the, the time horizon of a study. And this is how we connect the testing phase with troponent, for example, or other risk scores with long-term outcomes. So actually a model is a model because it follows a very highly a, a highly structured approach. And all this information is processed in an analytical framework Let's call it that way. And by using advanced analytical, uh, uh, advanced statistical uh, techniques and methodologies, this approach really can manage the uncertainty in the data, the lack of insufficient, uh, the lack of sufficient information, and minimize the risk with a decision. So this is an it's a kind of a very established tool, really in an early situation of um, also a biomarker. So back to cardiovascular diseases and how we and ideas to solve it. We already heard about uh, heard about a couple of studies that really have shown that considering high sense troponin I helps to better identify those at risk for cardiovascular diseases. And as I already alluded to, so um, we are also interested in quantifying the effect. I can. Okay, <laughs> so we are also interested in quantifying the effect, such as, you know, how big is the improvement in, in outcome? What about the, uh, um, the resources required? Would this add value and would this, good, would this be good value for money? So as I said, um, this is the concept and idea of a health economic model. And this was the starting point for a study that we um, recently published uh, last year, or that we published last year. And in the following minutes, I'd like to summarize and discuss the design and the results of the study. So the objective was really to um, evaluate the cost effectiveness of using high sense troponin I for assessing cardiovascular disease risk in a general population at working age. And we used actually a do nothing strategy as baseline. And this is a very important aspect because so um, you may argue that, you know, so we, we, we should use the uh, most recommended guideline, uh, most recommended strategy as a comparator. However, actually we found in some literature and also we did a survey in Germany that, for example, uh, only 40 to 50 percent of patients who really had an, had an event, you know, were risk assessed with, uh, with uh, before the event. So we can say half of the patients actually were never risk assessed before um, before the event. And in many cases, in almost the majority of cases, the GPs do not use any of the recommended tools. So that was the reason why we decided to use a do-nothing strategy as baseline start from there. Okay, so then actually we assume that um, all subjects was screened with high sense to opponent and I and assigned to these three risk categories, low, moderate, and high risks. And the subjects in the high risk category receive preventive medication. And this is what we call the screen and prevent strategy.
Well, a very key or important aspect, of course, is the underlying risk or the hazard functions, right? So, and these were derived from a prospective population-based cohort study in Norway, the Hunt study. Um, we already learned about that. So, and the risk functions of the Hunt study here stratified by uh, troponin risk categories actually summarizes and uh, summarize the, the um, occurrence and the time of all events over a period of 10 years and more. So um, the context is an important aspect in a cost effectiveness analysis. And we selected two different settings. One was a high income country with low risk for CVD and the other was a middle income country, but high risk uh, for CVD. So, and we use Germany and Kazakhstan as examples. Talking about the endpoints and the outcomes, so the study reported the uh, number of cardiovascular disease events and deaths, the healthy life years, the so-called quality adjusted life years, and the direct and the indirect costs, so the productivity losses over a period of 10 years. So one very important aspect, of course, in a model is the model validation, because um, this really tells us whether the predictions and results are accurate and robust. So, and that of course is the, the, the uh, sense of everything in, in, in modeling, right? So, and without going to details here, I'd like to I'd just like to highlight the, the um, excellent concordance of the survival curve generated by the model here in blue and the Kaplan-Meier curve from the Hunt cohort, which is uh, shown in red. So, Let's talk about um, let's talk about the results and let's look into the clinical results first. So in our in in our study, subjects, as I said, were stratified by troponin risk uh, risk classes, and about four point five percent of subjects really fell into the high risk troponin category. And as mentioned, only these were referred to preventive medication in the screen and prevent strategy. But let's first check the number of events in the do nothing strategy. So less than, about 6% of, of subjects experienced an event um, within 10 years of follow-up. And importantly, so, and that is what, we, what, what the Hunt, Hunt study shows, that the risk really increases sharply depending on the troponin risk classes from 2.8% uh, um, to 2.27%, uh, uh, almost tenfold increase. So, um, and a fifth of all events, more than a fifth of all events really happened to subjects in, uh, uh, really happened in only 4.5% of subjects. So, this really tells us that the risk stratification with troponin really works. But what if we change management? What if management were changed, right? And the screen and prevent strategy really gives us, gives us um, an answer here. Again, there was no change in treatment for those classified as low or median risk. Um, and no change in management really means no change in outcome, of course. And on the other hand, a significant reduction um, in risk and CVD events could be observed or was observed for the high risk group. And these reductions actually um, correspond to a relative risk reduction of about 9% for the total population and more than 50% for those with elevated troponin I. Well, just to um, give you a complete picture also of the comparison of these two different settings, Germany and Kazakhstan. Well, basically the clinical picture was relatively the same. So less than 200 people would need to be screened in order to prevent one CVD event. And the CVD risk um, was reduced by about 9%. And this really equates to a gain of almost 30 healthy life years and 1,000 subject screens. So 30 healthy life years um, were gained um, with troponin strategy. So cost-wise, actually, um, the screen and prevent strategy 
um, led to a reduction in total cost in Kazakhstan and a moderate increase in cost in Germany. So the increase in cost per patient and per quality gain, so which is the, the, the standard expression of cost effectiveness, was proved to be very moderate. And so that's why the conclusion was made that screen and prevent was proved highly cost effective by the definition of uh, international uh, uh, guidelines in, cost, in terms of cost effectiveness. And it was actually cost saving in, in Kazakhstan. So the question always, and I already mentioned this, you know, are, these are these results robust? Right. Are these findings transferable to other countries? Well, and that is what we usually test in so-called um, sensitivity analysis or scenario analysis. And I don't want to go too much into the details here, but I just would like to, I want you to draw, I would like to draw your attention to the red lines here that actually indicates the threshold of cost effectiveness. So, and as long as the figures or bars or dots really do not cross the red line, the screen and prevent strategy with Chaponin provides benefit and remains cost effective. So here the analysis, you know, really corroborates the, the preference for screen and prevent. Um, so we, it, the analysis uh, provide uh, high confidence in the, in the results. It confirms the robustness of the analysis, and but it also indicates the boundaries of um, of the conclusions. For example, here in case of very very low uh, uh, proportion of high risk subjects, um, or a lower effect of the treatment, for example. Um, why is or why was screen and prevent cost saving in Kazakhstan? and cost effective in Germany? Well, there are certainly several reasons, but an important aspect, of course, is the socioeconomic situation and the local price level. And this is an interesting slide that provides a closer look into um, the um, economic flow and impact. Right? So this actually uh, illustrates the investments and savings in both set settings. And the baseline is the, the do nothing strategy here, um, the indicated by the dotted line. So starting from do nothing, of course, screening and prevention obviously required an investment, as you can see. And please note the difference in price level between these two countries. So the 9% reduction in CVD in CVD events, sorry, um, really led to a decrease in direct medical costs um, that are, as again, the resources required really to treat the events. But in addition to that, we observed a huge impact on um, indirect costs, so the productivity losses here. Um, due to premature deaths, as I said, disease-related absence from work and so forth. And the reduction in indirect costs really largely compensated um, the investments. And this resulted in an overall saving in Kazakhstan and a moderate but highly cost-effective um, investment in Germany. So, um, this is a very important slide, <laughs> and uh, this chart actually shows the the benefit, the the size of the benefit or the incremental net monetary benefit. Um, so, as a function of the underlying risk, and also as a function of the country's economic situation, because we use these two different settings as a comparator. Why is this important? Why is this important? Because this graph actually helps us to understand whether screen and prevent could be cost effective in other regions as well. And this is important because it indicates the range of conditions under which troponin would be cost effective or the troponin risk assessment. So, and the dotted line really refers, refers to the, um, to the to the assumption in in our study, and um, um, in short, actually, the higher the the higher the um, the risk, 
the higher the health economic benefit of troponin. And in summary, our, our study really considered different regions, different socioeconomic context, and discussed different baseline risks for CVD. And the conclusion is, in settings that fall within this range, the use of troponin I for risk assessment would be cost effective or even cost saving. And of course, as I mentioned, we used a risk function that was derived from a cohort in Norway. And in order to understand whether this, the study results are transferable to other regions, we also want to know, um, and I, I showed this on the introductory map, that the risk for CVD can really um, vary between countries and regions. So the question was then whether the data from Norway could be applied to Germany um, or to, uh, to the studies uh, uh, selected in our, uh, to the countries selected in our studies, so Germany and, and, and Kazakhstan. And therefore we really compared the official incidence rates of Germany and Kazakhstan with the incidence in Norway during the follow-up of the Hunt study. And the purpose, and the purpose of, for the purpose of today's presentation, I also added uh, a couple of, of other countries in Canada, Argentina, Mexico, and, and so forth. So, and it really turns out that the Hunt study reflects the risk in Germany relatively well. It actually underestimates the risk slightly. It really underestimates the risk in Kazakhstan. I dare to say that it that Hunt reasonably reflects the risk in most other countries. So please keep in mind that this is all before the pandemic. So, and if we recall the, um, the results from the previous slide, so then we can actually conclude from the study as a take home message, that assessing the cardiovascular disease risk with a single test and then referring those at high risk to preventive means would be cost effective. The actual amount of the benefit, so the size of the cost effectiveness, however, really depends on the current preventive means, so on implementation of prevention programs, and of course, on the socioeconomic situation of the country. So I, I pause here and thank you so much for, for your attention. Uh, thank Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Juliger. Very interesting data. It's great to see that uh, this uh, uh, health economics data and to see that uh, um, how this CADE biomarker is cost effective. And, uh, and the other thing is this, this data are quite valuable for, uh, as we know, for payers, for health decision makers, and also for the healthcare uh, professionals. Because at the end of the day, we need to improve the, uh, the outcomes, the cardiovascular outcomes. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, we have the time uh, after the presentation for, for, for questions. And uh, I will move to our next speaker, um, uh, Dr. Nord. Um, we have on the one hand, uh, the, the evidence that Dr. Ibarren presented previously. We have the cost effectiveness data. Uh, from Dr. Yuli Ger. So, what is missing? The practical implementation of the high sense troponin I in the daily clinical practice. So, um, in MedCan, tell us more about this practical implementation. What are the benefits that we get as a healthcare system? Close yours. Great. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Varuna. It's great to be here. Thrilled to be part of the symposium. And, and yes, just as you mentioned, I, uh, building on uh, some of the information that we've just heard about, uh, a little bit about uh, MedCan. The, uh, it is really a, a, what we're looking at is the practical application of high sense troponin I in a it's very uh, specific population. So uh, MedCan is in, located in uh, Toronto, Canada. Uh, we will have locations uh, across Canada, and we're looking at the U.S. as well. And our focus has been over the last 30 years really uh, about prevention. So much of the healthcare system is is focused on the on the crisis intervention, the reactive mode, uh, as as uh, as things have happened to people as their health and wellness has suffered either through accident or illness. And we have long believed that 
there is value and sort of that ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And so uh, we have a, a fairly large population. So MedCan is about 500 employees and staff members. Many, many of those are physicians and nurses and uh, other allied health professionals. And uh, a, a lot of what we've done is build uh, a relationship with about 40 or 50,000 individuals that have demonstrated that they care uh, about their health and they care about prevention. And so we have built a series of programs over the last 30 years to support people initially uh, in a very focused on prevention and then uh, subsequently based on what we find in our preventative screening programs actually offer solutions that are innovative and, and best practice uh, and, and provide that, uh, those interventions in a very timely way and then do follow-ups. So we do a lot of uh, measurement of outcomes uh, as uh, to ensure that the, our individuals are, are doing well uh, overall. And so that's just a, a bit about where we've come from. And then over the last uh, 17 months, we've, been, we've had a very interesting relationship uh, with this high sense troponin I in that uh, we did this in the middle of a pandemic. And just like everybody else has been dealing with those particular challenges, we have uh, had to modify specifically our annual health assessment, which is this comprehensive screening. It's basically a day long assessment uh, with uh, anywhere from eight to 14 different stations or, or, or uh, assessments that happen, uh, including physician, including imaging, including a, a very robust blood panel. Because of the risk of aerosolization, like many uh, healthcare organizations, we had to stop uh, exercise stress testing. So a, a percentage of our population that fit certain criteria were offered an exercise stress test is a way to, to start to determine cardiovascular health in conjunction with a number of other strategies that we've brought together. So that made perfect sense. Uh, but at the same time that that was happening, we started to think, is there a better way? Is there a better way for us to screen for cardiovascular disease? And just about that same time, uh, high sensitivity troponin I uh, with past Health Canada approval, and we've had a long and uh, uh, great working relationship with Abbott over the years in terms of our other lab tests that we offer to our patients. And as a result, we were able to uh, start to utilize uh, high sensitivity troponin I with virtually all of our annual health assessments. And to give you a bit of a sense, and this sl slide starts to look at uh, relatively some of the numbers that we're, st what we're seeing. And uh, got on a rough, roughly, we will see this year 20,000 people will end up going through. These are 20,000 discrete individuals that will go through our uh, annual health assessment. And so in our first year, uh, again, we're at uh, 17 months in, but at 12 months, we had 20,000 people that had gone through. Um, about 80% or so of those uh, individuals would have uh, actually had a high sensitivity troponin as part of their screening. And then what we discovered uh, looking at uh, a bit of a segregation, the segmentation uh, between the high risk, uh, the moderate risk and the lower risk um, is that we had some very interesting uh, results uh, and we wanted to start to think about it very early on in terms not just of oh, interesting. Uh, we have a certain algorithm uh, actually mirrors exactly what we saw in our first presentation today. And uh, based on that, we uh, and the and the HS troponin I result that would trigger certain types of interventions, votes for the low risk, moderate risk, and ultimately the higher risk. And then we have had situations where somebody presented with higher risk, um, symptomatic or asymptomatic, and those, those two populations were treated slightly differently in terms of the urgency of the, uh, the immediacy of the, the next steps in terms of their, their algorithm. And so it was, uh, it's been very interesting for us uh, to, to think about the, these, this population. And so early on, we wanted to think about it in, in a number of terms, uh, including uh, overall cost, uh, both to MedCan cost savings or versus cost and cost savings to the uh, health system uh, that we work within as, as well, uh, as well as direct uh, impact on our physician, 
population and of course our patients as well. And so what we uh, started to do is uh, think about this um, in, in, these, in these different uh, ways, these different categories and, and uh, thinking initially the this hypothesis that, um, that this would be a value add essentially and looking at specifically looking at stress testing versus HS troponin I and how did that how did that shake out over the over this year of the uh, pandemic and I'll, I'll jump ahead to the punchline here the punchline is uh, it's been so successful that we haven't actually gone back to exercise trust testing in, in any sort of screening capacity we are offering it as an urgent for those people that uh, we feel have an urgent need for it but the uh, but that was our initial hypothesis is how does this how does this new blood sample uh, compare to uh, exercise stress testing? So we looked at it uh, again in a number of uh, domains, and one of those was patient experience. Uh, for and we found that almost two thirds of patients preferred the high sensitivity troponin rather than going through uh, a stress test. And uh, there was certain time as well. So our for everybody, time is is important. And so we, we ended up saving uh, quite a bit of time, 37 minutes uh, that it took to do the exercise stress test. And the troponin was virtually no extra time because it was just added to our existing uh, blood panel. So, so that, was, that was good. Um, again, from the patient's perspective, uh, we had uh, at the time of our study, which was actually not even a full year, we had had 50 individuals uh, uh, at that point who uh, had fallen into this extremely high category of not just high, higher risk, but higher risk that had uh, some significant pathology associated with them. So these were individuals that we were um, lar very concerned about based on the, the degree of the, the results we were finding from the HS troponin I. So these weren't people that were 12 or 13, some of them were 50 or 60. And uh, virtually all of these extraordinarily high numbers. Uh, and again, this is an asymptomatic population that we were looking at. If, if they were symptomatic, we would not have, uh, we, they would have been triaged out of the prevention uh, stream. So these are asymptomatic individuals that may or may not have had uh, some previous cardiovascular risk, uh, but exclusively based on the HS troponin result, they were triaged into the uh, more urgent arm of our algorithm. And for those individuals, uh, they they were all referred to hospital and almost all of them went through uh, some diagnostics and virtually all of that group was found to have significant pathology. Many of them had stents, many of them uh, went on to have other procedures that were essentially life-saving and, and not life-saving 10 or 15 years away, but life-saving in the moment. So um, at the, that's why we sort of think about it as this pyramid on the previous slide and those people at the upper end of the pyramid um, are most benefit, benefited by the HS troponin. Um, and so that has been interesting. And you can imagine the testimonials that we've been able to secure both from our physicians and from these patients that this, this, this blood sample, part of this blood panel that we offered, will, drove them into a, a system that was essentially saving their lives, uh, that they were imminent at imminent risk of having a cardiovascular event. So you can imagine how positive they are, <laughs> these people about HS troponin. I will say as well, that even the people in the bottom of that period, even people that had a, a lower risk result, that that has value too. That's that's not a non-value, That's a, that is a value that we've leveraged uh, in, in together with other parameters, Framingham cholesterol values, uh, we do HSCRP for sure for these individuals. Based on that, we can actually have a discussion about their lower risk for cardiovascular disease. And so that's, that's a positive and it, it tends to reinforce good behavior. And secondly, uh, those individuals, we, they, about 80% of the individuals come back year after year and so we'll be trending this over time. And if we see that, that a, a low risk result it becomes a higher low risk result or a moderate risk result, uh, if that trend is going the wrong direction, that is interesting as well. So some of our, our low risk individuals, we consider that a baseline. And if we start to see a trend in the wrong direction, we'll obviously intervene. 
Uh, from the clinicians, uh, we've had uh, increased uh, clinical confidence and experience. The, uh, the physicians have, have noted a significant uh, reduction in the amount of time uh, that they had to uh, work through uh, an exercise stress test. There's a screening uh, that the physicians would have to do prior to the exercise stress test and uh, obviously counseling uh, subsequently uh, about the results and, and, and actually reading the tracings. Uh, took significant amount of time, and so they were really pleased uh, with the with the results uh, that that they had now a test that was arguably a, a better screening tool, uh, and it took less time and uh, less of the patient's time as well. So over seventy percent of the physicians were actually quite pleased uh, with the results that they were seeing, and in terms of minutes saved, um, and although it doesn't sound like much with at, at eight minutes but eight minutes uh, times the number of patients they're seeing during the day uh, adds up to the fact that they can actually see probably another patient in the same amount of time. And so that just uh, was a, a great optimizer of the day. And then just in terms of cost too, we wanted to look at uh, resource utilization and uh, the switch looking at uh, from equipment cost, space cost, staffing cost, we were able to reduce our overall uh, cost footprint by $284,000. So not an insignificant uh, benefit for, for our, our, our organization. And then when we look at the health system around us, and one of the things, the way we came up with the saving was around false positives. So exercise stress testing created a certain number of false positives, and those ended up going into the healthcare system uh, utilizing costs for further investigations that turned out to be normal in the end. And so uh, by uh, minimizing our reliance on exercise stress testing and uh, moving more towards HS Troponin I, we were able to demonstrate savings to our uh, payer system. Uh, so our health system was benefited uh, around us as well. So in terms of critical, critical success factors, uh, we, we really felt that the um, uh, engaging our physician staff early was very, very important uh, because this was a new test. They, they didn't really know, you know what this was about. And so it was, it was important that we uh, had a, an engagement process with our physicians. And so they understood that, that uh, this was a new test, but it was fully, fully documented. A lot of the research that we've seen today, we utilized in terms of providing the confidence uh, for our physicians to utilize this test. And then uh, we developed this algorithm in conjunction with our cardiologists um, and with Abbott's cardiology and, and looking at uh, other organizations. And as a result, they felt quite confident in mo moving forward with this new lab study. Um, the, the, the real benefit for them uh, as a selling feature was, of course, uh, time savings. So they, that was a positive. And uh, the fact that it was such a sensitive test uh, compared to what we were utilizing uh, at that time, uh, from a quality perspective, the outcomes were just remarkably different. And, uh, and so as a result, uh, we have uh, in included the HS Troponin I in virtually all of our um, adult uh, uh, screenings, uh, our annual health assessments. And so it's been, um, it's been an, uh, a, an extraordinary journey for us. We're very excited by what, we're, what we've seen. And ultimately uh, now we are looking at uh, and building on some of the, the work that we've seen in the earlier presentations. We are now looking at and uh, thinking about this almost like in a very proactive way we're lucky enough to have 20,000 individuals, uh, many of whom come back to us year after year after year. So we are, um, we're very excited about uh, creating a, a data a repository based on the data that we're going to be have, uh, ha we have with uh, HS Troponin I, plus our other biomarkers, plus we have a very robust genetics program. So we're, we're going to be overlaying some genetics information as well and then following along in a very proactive way uh, our individuals and, and following for uh, outcomes, uh, obviously all-cause all mortality as well as cardiovascular endpoints. And so we're very interested uh, in what those results could be, very excited by the potential. And we have this unique opportunity with our patient population uh, to follow them along uh, year after year. And of course, every year 
the uh, the data will just become more and more robust. So uh, so based on this uh, early experience with HS Troponin, we are very excited about building on some of the research that's already happened and create a, um, a, another research uh, uh, possibility based on this data pool. I'm sure we're going to be seeing, we can have lots of research papers uh, that could be uh, stemmed from uh, the kind of research uh, uh, potential that we have with this data warehouse uh, full of this information in, in, the, in this population, uh, which tends to be uh, slightly more male, but uh, high degree of female. And obviously, we want to be sensitive to sex and gender in research studies. And we're going to be lucky enough that our, our population tends to be uh, very equal in terms of male and female. So with that, I will, uh, I'll close. Uh, we have a, it, obviously this was a very successful project because we had a lot of people at MedCan uh, supporting this as well as uh, the team at Abbott. And uh, specifically, I wanna call out our, our, our lead cardiologist uh, for MedCan, Dr. Beth Abramson, who has uh, been instrumental in, in helping us uh, move this project along. So with that, I will uh, turn it back to Dr. Brunis. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nor, for the great presentation. I think it's it's great to see that uh, uh, not, you don't uh, improve outcomes, but also you have a um, you have a, a, a better uh, key performance indication for the healthcare system as well. But uh, I would like to open the discussion and to ask you uh, because because. This is not only the success, because I, I suppose that you have also some challenges and you had some barriers in this journey. So uh, could you tell us more about uh, how you, you, could, you, you overcame, overcame this, these barriers? Yeah, I think our, our big barrier right off the bat uh, was what I was I hinted at, which was the uh, physician adoption and physician engagement. We mm -hmm. we knew this was uh, was this was an, an unknown test. And so our physicians are uh, many of them are academic physicians. Uh, many they're all highly skilled, highly experienced. And so a degree of skepticism uh, was what had to be there. I mean, it, it's a new test. We had to actually prove to each physician at a time and as a group. Uh, that this was something that would be worth doing. I was convinced, uh, but that that all that just doesn't matter if the CMO is is convinced. Uh, they each have to be uh, offering his test to their patients, and uh, from uh, the testing, they need to be able to uh, convey those uh, answers uh, uh, to their particular patients. So that was probably we knew going into it there would be a change management challenge. And so we uh, ad addressed that by, again, engaging very, very early. Um, that, was, that was one thing, uh, both individually and as a group. So that, that was the second thing that we ended up doing that was very successful. The other thing we did was we said, this isn't a permanent change. We're gonna look at this for three months, just three months. And if it's not working out, then fair, we'll, we, will, we won't use this test. And that also, I think provided them the reassurance that we weren't fully invested right off the bat, that if things weren't working out, that we could always back away. And so that offered them the ability to, to sort of engage in a way that said, you know, if, you know, our backstop on all of this is that if it's not working out exactly right, we can always revert back to previous change. So, uh, and, and of course, with physicians, especially data counts, data is very important. So offering them all the data uh, that we had at our disposal to let them really think through it uh, as questions came up, uh, both uh, Dr. Abramson and myself would answer those questions the best we could uh, to the point where they were successful and, and, um, and, and felt like this was something that we could more move forward with. And like every group of physicians, there's early adopters on one, one side, and on the other side, there's the skeptics. And we're no different. We have a large group of physicians that, uh, that work with us uh, on the screening uh, process. And so that um, generally what happened is the, the median uh, between those extremes gradually moved into the adoption phase. And, and, even, and today, uh, even though we still have the odd skeptical, like, you know, a little bit tough to convince, um, everybody's using it. Everybody's happy with it. Uh, we're still looking at the uh, results of, uh, of, the, of the testing 
And uh, I think they're very excited to be thinking about the proactive uh, nature of, of what we're doing that we can be screening and, um, and, uh, and, and, to, and go forward in a, in a way that can help not just our population, but populations around the world. I, I think it's it's very important, and you mentioned before about the evidence, and uh, I think the uh, with the troponin, uh, the issue is that uh, you know the all the cardiologists uh, uh, knows the you know the uh, the troponin the acute setting, so the uh, the challenge here is to uh, to to have the the right evidence to have the right early adopters to use the test, and I would like to ask you, and uh, we'll let also Dr. Ribarens to uh, comment as well. In practical terms, um, do you, do you believe that the current evidence that uh, the high sense troponin I has is uh, is robust? And the other question is, what was the and what is the patient focus? Uh, the focus is on patients with previous cardiovascular risk factor, like patients uh, with this, this lipidemia. Yeah, so for our population, it is people that we may have never seen before. These are people that may or may not uh, have any cardiovascular risk factors. And uh, but for sure, by the end of their assessment period, again, typically that happens throughout a day. Uh, we'll know by the end of the day and have a conversation with them based on the findings in day. So even though they might be new to us, uh, asymptomatic, low risk, um, we, we find things all the time. And not just in cardiovascular, we pick up occult cancers on a daily basis um, and occult uh, disease process specifically within cardiovascular domain. So so our population is, is, uh, is pretty broad in terms of the risk stratification. And uh, I, I think, uh, w what about you, Dr. Ibarren? Do you think that uh, from the epidemiologist's perspective, um, do you think that the, the evidence is quite robust and uh, you can easily set some practical recommendation based on that? What do you think? The, the evidence, uh, as I shown in my, in my talk, is sound and clear. The totality of evidence really points to the clinical usefulness of my sense to eye. However, as Dr. Nord in, in said, there's always the skeptics. And we know how hard it is to get uh, new indications into the guidelines. I think the Europeans are certainly ahead of, the, of us. Uh, there's no mention whatsoever of high sense to eye testing in the, in the current 2019 primary prevention and cardiovascular guidelines. The United States, and the, the really the, the the issue here is that there's no class two uh, R evidence, uh, class two randomized evidence. All the evidence that we do have is class two and R, not randomized. So uh, we really need to be thinking about how we can um, do uh, in a very cost effective and quick way randomized type study. And, and the Medcare environment, uh, I think, will. Uh, be a beautiful setting to uh, I'll talk, to, talk to you, Dr. Lord, about how we can incorporate uh, a, a clinical trial in your in your organization with a, a sort of maybe a crossover design or something, because that's what we need. We need <clears throat> more randomized evidence to demonstrate the, the utility. In terms of how this is, uh, who, who is going to benefit? <clears throat> this is benefiting everybody. And at the MedCan experience, that's really uh, highlighted that. If you are at low risk to begin with, a low level will reassure you. If you are at a moderate risk, it will tilt the balance to a more aggressive approach and diagnostic testing. And if you are if you are high, then you you know this is an urgency. You you better get tested because this could uncover uh, a, a, a significant coronary occlusion and save your life. So this is going to ultimately benefit everyone. But if you ask me, who should we start with? Probably the intermediate group. I think those are the people who probably will benefit the most, because that's where the therapeutic decisions are uh, more clear. Yeah, uh, I think at least from the uh, HR perspective, uh, what uh, Dr. Gulliger uh, presented before is uh, uh, based on the modeling, uh, assess the risk and treat the high risk. So. And uh, the other thing that I would like to uh, bring to the table is regarding the, uh, the existing risk prediction tools. And um, um, wh wh what, is the, what is the HR 
um, piece about that and um, Dr. Julgen, and also I will let uh, the rest of the speakers to to uh, to respond to that. So, um, do you need? Do we need to do uh, the assessment with with candidate troponi together? With the risk prediction tools that we have, the ESC score or the pool cohort equation. Yeah, yeah. Well, we of course we are always always striving for you know how do we improve health, right? So and uh, this is this is a continuum, and uh, evidence generation is a process, of course, also. And uh, so in this continuum, we always have to understand what is the baseline the baseline is set by the current practice of course right so and i mentioned this in my presentation what we found is that in many areas or despite the clinical recommendations uh, most gps are not using any scores and there might be several reasons and we had a discussion also with some some uh, cardiologists on this and but the point is um, we have to understand where we are, what is the current status, and then we have to compare a new idea with the current practice. Well, what we did in the previous study that I mentioned, so we set the baseline as do nothing. But of course, if if um, other practices are used, if uh, other uh, risk assessment tools are used in, in, in clinical practice, we have to understand, you know, what is the what is the improvement if we add high sense troponin to this or in other words is there an improvement or and if there is an improvement is this actually relevant enough to justify potential additional investment so this is the the term or the 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 topic of health economics and actually what we did is we're also working on data that are comparing the esc score with a combination of the esc score and high sense troponin and i and this this study has not been published yet but first results were already published in um, was it the Euromed lab meeting in 2019? And that actually indicate that also a combined assessment of the ESC score with high sense troponin reduced the risk almost almost um, um, in uh, almost the same size by about 10% or so. So the point is, and these are of course early results, but this would actually confirm the, re the study um, results that I presented and the conclusion that troponin support risk assessments do not only improve the identification of subjects at risk, but really also leads to, uh, to health economic benefits. So basically due to avoidance of, of CVD events and consequential costs. But I think it's really important to understand again, or to stress the fact again, that even this study is model based right so and building a model is a wonderful tool really in an early situation or where we are dealing with a lot of uncertainty but really analyzing observational data this would be the very next step right so and that's why i'm very much really thrilled by by the presentation of the medcam uh, um, um, data so this is this is a wonderful baseline for the next step to really understand, you know, so from actual observational data, this is the benefit of high sense to I believe I believe that the next step for for having real world evidence data is to, to capture um, the, the hard outcomes like cardiovascular mortality or incident uh, coronary artery disease. And um, I would like to learn more about that. And the, what is what is the uh, standard of practice by using high sensitivity troponin I in MedCAN, so, Dr. Nord. So um, what about the follow-up? What about the, if you reassess the troponin? Uh, what are your thoughts? Your yeah, practice? well, we're, yeah, it, as at this point, again, we're 17 months in, so we're just now starting to collect second data points on that roughly 80% of our population that returns year after year. So it, so it's early days still. We, we don't uh, you know, have a good idea at this point. Uh, we've just started to really think about how we're going to be able to collect the data in, a, in an appropriate way. But, uh, but we're already starting to see you know, two dot points uh, for an individual. And you know, we hope over, over the years that we've got five, six, eight, ten data points that will give us uh, some very interesting information on on trending as well so that's uh so that's how we've been 
so it's a bit early to be talking about any kind of trending specifically, uh, but in terms of how we treat people, uh, obviously there is a certain amount of, and I've had, and this goes back to working with the physicians, uh, it's sort of like saying, if you have a framing cam score on somebody, um, th is that going to drive a, a specific uh, next step in terms of the, the treatment of that patient? Well, no, it's going to be in the context of their overall health status and cardiovascular rib. What's their hemoglobin A1C? What's their height? What's their blood pressure? What's their, what's their uh, total to HDL ratios? Like what's their LP little a, what's their HSCRP? So I think that's uh, fascinating that, you know, as, as physicians, we pull all that together around the patient and then come up based on a, on a predictive algorithm of what we should be doing next. For the most part, most of our, most of these people, some of the next uh, the next two tests would be a stress echo or or separating, having an echocardiogram and a stress test. Obviously, putting those two together, having a stress echo, uh, would be the next most logical in a in a lower urgency situation. Again, that moderate uh, group uh, for sure. The the lower uh, uh, stratification of the higher risk. Uh, as well could do that, although we would uh, typically move to uh, imaging, sort of a cardiolite imaging, uh, stress perfusion imaging, uh, or ultimately uh, straight to angiogram and PCI. Uh, so actually getting interventional quite early, which I mentioned in our, in these uh, 50 plus individuals uh, that we, that's, that's the route that they took. So the, we have this uh, algorithm that is, uh, similar to what we, we heard earlier, uh, again, validated by our cardiologist and in use with our physicians, but it's always uh, adjusted to the clinical scenario of an individual patient and their overall cardiovascular risks. So it provides reassurance and comfort for the physicians that there is sort of a next step that, we, that would be logical and uh, something they could be very comfortable going with. But at the end of the day, I've always said, as physicians, we treat an individual physician as an individual. These are all N of one trials, essentially. And so the algorithm is there to help them in decision making. But at the end of the day, uh, it's based on their overall uh, risk uh, per, per, uh, situation that that individual person uh, would be coming forward with. I, I think uh, I think this is very, very important how the, you know, if you start something, how this can change the clinical practice uh, in terms of treatment, in terms of, and the, at the end of the day, uh, the objective is to reduce the cardiovascular outcomes. So um, before I, I close this uh, wonderful session, I would like to, um, one uh, message uh, from you about the recertification and cardiovascular disease prevention. So we'll start with the Dr. Ibarren, one message from your presentation? Well, I, I, let me reiterate, to take home, I, I, think, uh, I think it behooves us to uh, teach our colleagues that there is a paradigm shift uh, in the high sensory world. That is a shift from the acute setting to the primary setting in asymptomatic populations. That, that would be, to me, is the biggest take home message. So you hear? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Um, I would actually like to echo Dr. Nott's, uh, um, uh, what Dr. Nott said, a data counts. And I think it's really important to keep collecting data, to keep collecting information and um, learn, right? So I think we are on a journey. We are on a journey of evidence generation and uh, we have a wonderful uh, the wonderful uh, prospects and and baseline information. So we need to um, continue on this journey by collecting data. Okay. Um, thank you so much. I think it was a great discussion, and I would like to thank also the audience uh, for the attention. And um, I hope that uh, we will have uh, other opportunity to discuss also this uh, this wonderful talk thank you so much thank you thank you